Nuclear Regulatory Commission issuing a red flag at the Fort Calhoun plant in Nebraska and last year's disaster at the Fukushima Daiichi plant in Japan, nuclear energy is back on everybody's radar. But despite some of these recent events, nuclear energy is a reality in the global energy picture now and in the future, as we have witnessed when U.S. President Barack Obama approved the plans for the construction of two new reactors. But what do we do in the case of an accident? What do we do with the waste produced even in optimal circumstances? Joining us to discuss a new approach to this problem is Dr. Thomas E. Albrecht Schmidt, a professor of civil engineering and geological sciences and concurrent professor of chemistry and biochemistry at Notre Dame University. Welcome, Dr. Albrecht Schmidt. Thank you very much. So today there are more than 436 nuclear power plants operating around the world. Approximately how much waste do these plants produce each year? It's a relatively small amount. The the total amount that the power plants have generated, I can tell you the U.S. number, I don't know worldwide, but uh, by about 1995, we had generated about 60 to 70,000 metric tons of what was once called spent fuel and is now called used uh, fuel. It's an amazing thing, perspective, because you say that's a relatively small amount. And in my mind, I hear this number of tons and I'm like, geez. Well, the, 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 the difference would be if, if you looked at the amount of energy that was generated based on that amount of fuel, it's, it's an astonishing uh, you know, number of terawatts of, of energy to generate that amount of waste. And if you were to contrast that with the burning of fossil fuels and run the calculation how many tons of carbon dioxide was produced, you know, burning coal or, or, or other fossil fuels, it's a huge difference. The amount of waste that comes out of a power plant is just a, a minuscule fraction compared to consuming fossil fuels. So I guess everything is relative. Conventionally, how have people dealt with, how have they treated this waste? What have they done with it? Well, it depends on the country. In the U.S., we have not recycled any of the uh, waste that has come out of power plants. So it is, um, it is removed from the reactors and placed into uh, very large pools where it cools often for a number of years, maybe 10 years. Uh, that might be a little on the long side. This enables uh, short-lived isotopes to decay away and, and the physical heat that comes off the, the used uh, fuel to cool down. And then from there, it's, uh, it's placed into these rather large, multi-layered concrete casks. And those are stored directly on site at all of the plants in the U.S. Other countries have taken a different approach. In the, uh, in the 1950s, the U.S. developed a number of recycling procedures where we could separate the uranium. And most of the fuel actually isn't burned. I should say that probably the greatest tragedy of, of nuclear energy is we only get 1% of the available energy out of the fuel before fission products build up in the fuel that, that ruin the efficiency. And so that's the reason we have to pull the rods out long before uh, most of the usable energy has been taken out of them. So anyway, in the 1950s, we developed techniques for dissolving the fuel, removing uranium so it could be reused, removing plutonium, because that's an excellent fuel source, removing that to be reused. And then the other products, many of which are not radioactive, can be sent down in different waste streams. And there's a number of names for those processes, but the, the most common one uh, is, is called Purex, and there are a number of variations on that. So in other countries like England and, and Japan and Russia, um, they use Purex-like processes to reprocess fuel. In England, they have not reburned any of the plutonium, so at, at last count, they had 150 tons of isolated plutonium awaiting a political decision on whether to to bury that in a repository or to, to burn it in reactors. Uh, Japan is certainly has made plutonium-containing fuels. As a matter of fact, there were those kinds of rods in one of the reactors at Fukushima. And it, there's a variety of things you can do. So you can, you can definitely recycle the fuel. It turns out that that's really a, a political decision and not an economical decision. Uranium ore is so cheap that it's much cheaper to simply dispose of the waste and not to recycle it. But if, uh, if your goal is to obtain plutonium, which you might want to do for a variety of reasons, then, then recycling becomes an option. But that's a political and not economical decision. Your research is leading us to a new way to possibly dispose of the waste. And again, 
maybe even be able to recycle it and use it again. Can you explain to us a little bit about your use of thorium? Yeah, so uh, thorium is is the first member of what's called the actinide series, and you know it, it the it first element is thorium, and then protactinium and and uranium. And so thorium has a, a very long half life of 14 billion years. It, it can be used as a fuel source itself, and as a matter of fact, India has has thorium breeder reactors. And I think after Fukushima, you know, there was a number of reports coming out of China discussing how much safer a, a thorium cycle would be. Um, we use thorium because of its its rather unique properties. Uh, it, it can do chemistry that basically no other element can do. And so we, we have developed a material that has a unique ability to trap other radioactive ions. And so in radioactive waste, there are a number of very long-lived fission products. So one of those products is called technetium. Uh, is called technetium. It's the specific isotope is technetium-99. It turns out it's a very useful isotope for medical purposes. Uh, you know, I think there's something like a million procedures a year involving technetium. But it is also a very long-lived radioactive ion that is very, very difficult to trap. There's basically no natural mechanism that retards its release into the environment. And so uh, we've developed a material that, that selectively removes technetium, even when there's vast amounts of other things competing uh, to get into the material. It it's only removes uh, the technetium from the waste. And so this provides an effective way of trapping it and preventing its release into the environment. And, and the material can be used more broadly. There also are or radioactive isotopes of iodine. That, as a matter of fact, the first things detected coming off of Fukushima were hot isotopes of iodine. And, uh, and this material will trap those as well. And so uh, it can be used uh, definitely in, in environmental remediation. And how effective is it? How much of the waste does it absorb? 96%. Wow. So it's, it's, it's very good. It, it has a... Uh, it's its capacity for for absorbing waste is more than an order of magnitude larger than any existing material and all of the existing materials were not selective in other words they were overwhelmed by all of the other components of the waste whereas this one ignores the things that we aren't interested in and it only uptakes the ions we wanted to take up why does it only get the stuff you want is it like panning for gold where the holes in the crystal or are of a certain no, size. You're, you're right. There are pores. There are there are holes in the crystal. And those holes have a very specific size and they have a very specific charge. And that combination of size and charge selects ions that only possess certain characteristics. So then it that's how it selects one ion versus another. And I'm assuming that you can't use this thorium indefinitely, that there must be at some point where the energy output would be too low or the thorium's ability to absorb energy is exhausted. Do we have any idea what is the extent to which... Well, that's actually one of the most exciting developments. And we actually discovered this material two years ago, and I was, I was concerned about its ability to be used for the exact uh, reasons you just raised. You know, you know, what's its maximum uptake and how long you can use it? And one of the things we discovered over the last year is we can recycle the material. So we can load up, we can have it extract all the ions we want from waste, and then we have a mechanism for ejecting those ions, which allows you to trap them in, in another form, and then we can reuse the thorium material, and we can do that endlessly. It never degrades. So you can use it to selectively trap what you want. You can eject those and keep reusing it again and again. And that's, again, something that's, that's unprecedented, it is, is, is a recycled uh, material that you can recycle for this purpose. Now, it sounds like the thorium is a naturally occurring item, but do you have to process it? Do you have to go through special procedures to make it so that it will be useful for this kind of work? Thorium is naturally occurring. That's correct. As a matter of fact, there's, there's about four times more thorium on Earth than there is uranium. And uranium actually isn't that rare of an element. We, we, none of us like to think about this, but you know, the bedrock, the granite, for instance, that we might build our houses on, has quite a bit of uranium in it. That's why we are concerned about things like radon in our basements. That's from uranium uh, decaying. So thorium is four times more abundant uh, than that, but it, it turns out that this material is extremely easy to prepare, and all of the common 
uh, chemicals, all the common chemical forms that you would buy thorium in, like thorium oxide and thorium nitrate and thorium carbonate, everything you could think about, you can do a one-step reaction and make this very useful material and very high yield. So it, it has a very, it's very convenient to make, surprisingly easy to make. Now, it's my understanding that you've only experimented so far in using thorium to absorb radiation under lab conditions. Do you expect if you bring it out into the field that you will find some variability that may surprise you? There were actually, I wouldn't call them full-scale tests, but there were a beyond laboratory-scale test done at Savannah River National Lab by a collaborator of mine named David Hobbs. And uh, he tested it in waste streams, so not just mock-up experiments uh, in, a, in a university, but actually un, under more realistic conditions at a national lab where they have millions of gallons of this kind of waste. And it worked very effectively on, on, in that scenario as well. So we don't think... We don't think this is just going to be a laboratory artifact. When I was studying psychology, there were a number of theories that we were presented in which students said, well, of course that's how the mind works and how people respond. When hearing about this thorium, the same question is popping into my mind. Why haven't we thought of this before? What has happened that we've just now realized the potential of this. You know, there's there's so much serendipity built into science, it's mind-boggling. I mean, if we went through and, and named off the number of amazingly useful things that were discovered, I, I don't want to say this was by accident because it was a it was a targeted discovery, but a lot of the a lot of the properties of this material I, I can't say were designed. It, it, we really uh, we're very lucky to find. So you think about things like Scotchgard and Post-it notes and you name it. There's There's been so many scientific discoveries that are extremely useful that are, are purely serendipitous. Um, so I would I would say this was a, a serendipitous discovery. Uh, one of my uh, colleagues at another school says that we're trolling, but it's true that we are trolling, but the waters are really well stocked. And so we hook a lot of fish like this. And probably the last question is this useful more for cleaning up waste at a operating nuclear facility, or would this be useful for large-scale accidents, say like a Fukushima or a Chernobyl, or worse yet, a dirty bomb or a nuclear attack? Could it be used for things like that? You know, uh, boy, that's a lot of different scenarios. I mean, a nuclear attack, the the mess is so catastrophic, I think this would play a, a pretty minor role. In, uh, in that kind of cleanup. It could certainly help uh, uh, removing some of those radioactive ions from, say, the, the tanks uh, at Fukushima. It, it certainly can work at a place uh, that stores, uh, you know, places like, like you know, uh, Savannah River has more than 50 1.2 million gallon tanks of high-level waste. And it can certainly remove all the, you know, it's, you measure the amount of technetium in that waste in terms of hundreds of tons of technetium, and it can soak all that up. It's it's uh, it's it's perfect for that. Someone uh, uh, blew up a city. Uh, that, that's a, that's well beyond the capabilities of this this kind of material. Looking at a new substance that may produce a cleaner world for the prism on Voice of Russia. I'm Andrew Hiller speaking with Thomas Albrecht Schmidt.